uh, my name is Armin Babajani, and I'm with the uh, World Affairs Council on their CEO. Uh, and joining me, yeah, you're not a fan of that. Hold the applause for everyone. Norma, my team, Samantha Story, is actually zooming in from Pennsylvania. She didn't want to miss out. Um, and we also have Rachel Martin. Uh, I think she will just uh, welcome you all at the bottom of the staircase. Um, but, and also Mary Ann, thank you for being here as well. We're also joined by board members, including our chair of the board, Peggy Pace. But could, if all the board members could raise your hands so people know who you are, thank you all for being here. Um, is really work with us. And Jessica, thank you so much for working tirelessly to make sure all the sound and everything sounds really good. So thank you to the museum for hosting and also for all the collaboration, as well as the Jewish Federation um, and your team, Nami, for uh, collaborating with us. So we really appreciate that. Uh, finally, I want to thank the panelists for making time for us to be here. Uh, you'll soon meet all of them. Um, we have Laura Chesler here. We have uh, Nami Ichchak. <laughs> I was trying to get the in there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> one of the few things Armenians and, and the Jewish people have in common is the uh, And Toma, uh, Tomas Machaldo from uh, the Auschwitz Birkenau Museum in Poland is joining us. Our master of ceremonies, Jonathan Gerwitz. Uh, and of course, our esteemed moderator, uh, Winslow Sport, who, when the idea was presented to us, he ran with it. And he has made this possible for you all to be here. Thank you, my brother. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Winslow. Uh, finally, we are also grateful to our special guests who are who also have uh, busy schedules who are here today. Graham Weston is here. Uh, Mauro Garza, our District Attorney Joe Gonzalez, uh, Senator Menendez, and Arlene Starr are all here. So thank you for joining us. Yes, please. Round of applause. members or myself and some of my team could also uh, share some of the uh, insights about what we do at the World Affairs Council so we really appreciate you for uh, making time of your afternoon to join us for this program a very critical part of human history which is the Holocaust you know when I lived in Poland from 2014 to 2016 I made it certain to travel to the city of Oshwingen did I say that right Perfectly well. <laughs> Washington is uh, it's about an hour west of Krakow, southwestern Poland. And everyone advised me before I went there that the experience was uh, of visiting was, was going to be uh, one that was you couldn't prepare for, uh, nor would you forget it. And that is certainly the case with my experience. And just because we have the museum at Auschwitz Birkenau, where Tomasz is, and, and we have a museum here, and a lot of people know about the Holocaust, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to educate people, and not only locally, but globally, uh, about the Holocaust. And uh, this is a gem in our community, so kudos to the donors and funders for the Holocaust Museum for making this happen. And one thing I left out is, after we are done, um, they're, they're welcome, you're welcome to stay and get a tour. There are different exhibits in this room. There's some exhibits to the sides as well. The staff here will be happy to um, give you a tour. Um, you know, every community had, or cause or idea has their champion or advocate. Uh, we have many of those people right here uh, in this room today. And um, one person I want to talk about is, is special because I've known him for a long time. He's a local representative who has a loud voice, but not because it's loud, but because he believes in the truth and he uh, he gets things done and speaks for people who are not represented. 
Um, he's a former city council member. He's a former state representative. He is now a state senator, and he's a champion for our community. Please join me in welcoming Senator Jose. Newman. I don't know what I do, but every time I sit, I just think this is possible not to become emotional. Um, this is a critical time. Resolving these lessons of the past to inform the work that's still sort of ongoing and necessary today. I'm so glad we have such an able leader here to guide us, and I'm glad that I get to have pleasure of introducing my friend and our master of ceremony, Jonathan Gerwitz. And I'm sure everyone in this room knows him, but for those of you who don't, uh, you may not know, and you should understand, that Jonathan has a critical eye. He's someone with deep roots in examining current events and their impact on our community. All of this is a member of the Board of Work Association of Divorce and all of these heads of jail, all of these he reported and analyzed the steps and the missteps of local leaders as we as the city grappled with the challenges of its growth. Now, as vice president for HPBC Texas, he focuses on messaging, a local initiative of single leader and has potential to transform. In addition to his career, Jonathan has made the decision, the leader decision, to impact our community in ways that won't benefit. He worked with big brothers and sisters and from the Humane Society and from the Mobility Coalition, Jewish Federation of San Antonio, and his work as a board member of the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. This is discussing it right before we came in. So all I can say about Jonathan is that he uses his skill, he uses his words, his intellect, his insight to impact local action and greater good. Thank you, Senator. Jonathan is my family leadership on Dave's blog, or especially for your leadership on SBA system A, the Holocaust was tremendous for members. Um, I want to read, for those of you who aren't familiar with that piece of legislation, I just want to read a small caption from SB 1828. Its intent is to educate students about the Holocaust, inspire the students a sense of responsibility, to recognize and uphold human value, and to, to prevent future atrocities. The governor shall designate a week to be known as Holocaust Remembrance Week in public schools. Holocaust Remembrance Week shall include age appropriate instruction as determined by each school district. And instruction should include information about the history of the lessons learned from the Holocaust, participation in person or using technology, learning, learning projects about the Holocaust, and the use of materials developed or approved by the Texas Holocaust Genocide. The importance of that legislation and the importance of that study are in the community daily. And um, I was just learned of an incident that happened in the Deerfield neighborhood uh, just in the last days. So I just want to enhance that and clear it. So um, when we hear things happen in Southlake or in different parts of the state or across the nation, Texas has actually been a leader on this issue of setting the law and what it means to be a citizen. What it means to be an upstander. Senator, thank you again for your leadership in making uh, Texas a leader on, on, on the Holocaust study and in the study of this. You might think that the Holocaust, this holy study, is one of the best documented crimes, best documented historical events. But through the work of museums like this, the Museum of Washington, the Museum at Auschwitz, 
of researchers like Pat, Father Patrick Dubois. There is always new information that is being learned about the Holocaust. And most importantly, of giving life to the people who were the victims whose lives were taken. Just recently, in the last week or two, there were discoveries in Babayar of uh, identification of victims and also identification of perpetrators at that Babayar. So um, there is still much to be learned about the Holocaust. There is much that our society can gain from learning about the Holocaust. I want to thank our host, and the Jewish Federation, Peggy and Armin, the World Affairs Council, for helping put this together. Thank you all for attending. Now it's my pleasure to invite my friend Winslow Spark, Spark, the founder of One Million Dreams, to get us started. Thanks, Thank you, Thank you Jonathan. Uh, of course, it's an honor to work with you at Federation on this, and I really appreciate your leadership in all things. Um, to introduce myself a little bit, I'm the immediate past chair of the Jewish Community Relations Council. And given the, the privilege of working with many of you on some very key issues. Um, I'm also actually have the recent privilege of being on our District Attorney Joe Gonzalez's community, community advisory panel, where we get to um, advance the cause of criminal and social justice through, through legal means. Uh, I do want to welcome and acknowledge my rabbi, who's also with us, Rabbi Avram Scheinberg. Thank you for joining us today in this important conversation. Uh, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to talk a little bit about some of their personal connection to the Shoah, to the Holocaust, and why this conversation is so important to them. I'd like to begin with um, an observation or reflection of my own, and it has to do with Auschwitz, probably one of the most emblematic symbols of the Holocaust, and it conjures up different things for each of us, and many of us have somewhat direct or indirect connections to that dark moment in human history. Personally, I think about my first cousin, Alexander. Alexander was named after my grandfather who had just previously, two years previously, been murdered in Mutthausen, another concentration camp. And Alexander, Ben Arye Shlomo Alevi, was taken to Auschwitz from the home, which was right next door to my mom's home in Amsterdam, taken to Auschwitz in cattle cars. And my first cousin, Alexander, was barely two years old. And I, what I understand is he was crying. So the Nazis threw him up in the air and caught him on the end of a bayonet. And a few years later, his parents, my aunt and uncle, and I'm gonna say their names because we do that, um, Arye Shlomo, Ben Alexander Halevi and, and his wife, Flora. Uh, we lost them. And the question is, how could this possibly happen? How could they, my immediate family, 300 of my own direct relatives, and 6 million of my people and many million others have suffered such horrors? And, you know, Ellie Wiesel said it very clearly. And, and my, my previous rabbi, Arya Scheinberg, would sometimes quote this, and he would say, of blessed memory, he would say, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. And the world was indifferent. And that's why these things occurred. When my mother at 12 years old was marched from her home and put in a cattle car and taken to Bear from Belsen, which she survived, but my grandmother did not, uh, Again, it was because the world was not here. And why I and my colleagues and all of us are here is to not only study and know and remember, that's how we honor them, but also through this education to be that light, which as my father would say that we don't tolerate intolerance and that we challenge directly xenophobia, anti-Semitism, racism, hatred, and discrimination. And so the conversation that I hope to ignite a little bit and listen about is not only our connections and, and to remember our loved ones, but to take those lessons forward and how, just as the work that Senator Menendez and several people, Barda and many people in this room have done to advance uh, social justice through, through 
Holocaust education. Um, our work is obviously not finished. So I would like to ask uh, Tomaj uh, to, in a few moments, just tell us a little bit about their mission and their work. But just before that, with our panelists, to ask Laura, who has a close relationship and does some work in Holocaust education, just speak a little bit about uh, your connection uh, partially and then some of maybe some of the work you're doing while you're here today. Okay, um, I'm Laura Chesler, and uh, my dad was a Holocaust survivor, and um, he was actually one of the original uh, people who, who had the original idea for having a Holocaust museum in San Antonio, and was instrumental in raising the money for it. And I think it was very important to him because he did feel that if you don't remember and you forget, it's going to happen again. And so this was created to be a center for learning and really created in some way for children so that they would learn and begin to understand the history and enact in their lives um, or take action in their lives that would prevent this from happening again. I have, uh, I've not recently, but in the past been very involved with the museum. I uh, chaired the board and um, you know, was instrumental at the museum for a number of years and have done other work in the community with um, organizations such as the National Conference of Christians and Jews, which was eventually uh, named the uh, United Communities of San Antonio. And their mission was to eliminate bias, bigotry, and racism. So um, just over the years, I have been involved in San Antonio, um, and it is very important to me and to my family, and I know to everybody here uh, that we continue this kind of work in our community. Thank you, Mr. Bass. Um, Nami, I'd like to hear a little bit about your connection to this and the global cause. Thank you, Lizzo. Thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Nami Yehovah. Um, uh, Armin, you don't get to be 50 plus years old without hearing my name shared in different ways. So, so it's, it's, it's okay. Um, I, am, I have the privilege of being the president and CEO of the Jewish Federation of San Antonio, um, which is the umbrella organization for the museum. And, um, and in my role, um, you know, I personally, I'm a second generation survivor. Um, although I don't like to use that phrase because um, genuinely, I believe everybody sitting here is a survivor of the Holocaust. Um, I don't think you necessarily need to be a direct, um, have a direct line of somebody who uh, was murdered during the Holocaust to be a survivor of this um, the story. So, so I would like to sort of frame that for everybody. Um, Jonathan mentioned that we happen to be in a, in a time um, in the last 24, 48, 72 hours where a hate group um, has made its way to, um, to the limits of our city. And, um, and, and I was actually with Mrs. Wilson today. Um, according to this group, um, the Jews won World War II. Um, that's the kind of thing that was passed around um, in the neighborhoods, they uh, they threw leaflets with little pebbles to throw into people's driveways in um, in our local neighborhoods. Deerfield being one of them, Deer Park, Churchill Estates, um, neighborhoods where Jews reside um, and have found a home um, in the midst of, of uh, other faith groups, um, and with the intent of although not a physical threat, nothing in these documents. Uh, suggests a physical threat to anybody, but certainly physical threat, meaning that's the differentiator when law enforcement gets involved. Um, but the emotional threat that these flyers cause, um, the notion that uh, to be a Jew, to wake up, to go pick up the newspaper, or to go to your car and to see something that is so painful, so hurtful, so direct, so aggressive, um, that is why um, we have this museum in San Antonio, um, you know, uh, because of, of uh, the legislature and uh, 18, House Bill 1828, we have actually had a significant increase in the demand for Holocaust education, which is a wonderful blessing. Um, you know, there's two ways to remember the Holocaust. 
um, is to remember the Holocaust and to be um, depressed and sad. And, 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 and that is a reality of, of everybody who perished. Um, but today, especially today, on the first anniversary of the, of the passing of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, um, who once said that, that we shouldn't be depressed if we think about life as a gift. So every day we live, every day we have, is a day to be able to make a difference in the world. Um, the mission of the museum, the, the, or the principal purpose of the museum, is to help people become upstanders. Um, to not, you know, to, to Winslow's point uh, with Ellie Wiesel's quote, we don't have the luxury of standing by when evil occurs around us. We have a responsibility to, to take action, to do something. Um, and, and for me, being a Jewish communal service professional, um, having the honor of being the president and CEO of the Jewish Federation of San Antonio, um, I take that role very seriously. And, and having a gemstone like a Holocaust Museum in San Antonio um, is something that we should be incredibly proud about. Um, having the responsibility to educate, you know, pre-COVID we were seeing approximately 18,000 children a year um, walking through these doors and uh, being educated. And, and um, I do wanna recognize our docents um, who would give of their time to to provide the tours. And unfortunately, um, we are living through the, the end of, um, of personal Holocaust survivor stories. Um, this is a tragic time um, in the, the story of the Holocaust because uh, you know, people won't be able to hear the first hand story. People won't be able to, to hear that personal narrative of our Holocaust survivors. And so it's our responsibility to own those narratives and to make sure those stories continue. Um, and, um, you know, that's sort of my story. And I'm sure I'll have other opportunities to answer questions. So thank you. Thank you for that. And your work is, is um, does make a huge impact. And I'm sure we'll enjoy collaborating with you. Thank you for making a difference. Um, we we're going to have some um, question at comment cards we're going to distribute so for you to be able to write some questions that you have that you can that will be brought up to the panel and um so maybe we could do that while we hear from tomaj in uh in poland and uh tomaj you're you're there at the uh the auschwitz birkenau memorial and museum and i'd like to hear a little bit about you and and mostly about the mission there and the work that you're doing so you can please share that with us today well <clears throat> first of all um Thank you for, for the invitation and it's uh, very important for me and also for the museum and for the memorial that I can be here with you today and share a little bit about our mission and about what we are trying to, to do, how to, we are trying to educate people who are coming to, to, to the museum. And first of all, uh, really thank you Winslow for, for um, raising the issue of um, indifference. Because I think it's a it's a crucial part of of our education, as um, one of the survivors said just two years ago during the anniversary of the liberation of of the camp in January to it, on January twenty seventh, uh, Auschwitz did not descend from from the skies, which means that Auschwitz was not the first stage or of the of the Holocaust. It was rather its, its, its final stage, and it all started with the words, with the hatred towards, towards the others. But the biggest problem of that times so of, you know, 1930s and, and later was in fact the indifference. Because if there were people then who had stood up and really said out loud that this should be stopped, I'm talking about and that's Germany, then you know Austria, then of course uh, after the outbreak of the of the war and, and so on. If there were people who would say no, then maybe it would not lead to this extreme stage to the to to to, to genocide to, to, to the Holocaust. So um, it's really uh, I think we we do stress this 
when when educating about about Auschwitz and and, and the Holocaust. Just to share be, be, before I'll, uh, I'll tell you more about our, our educational activities here. Um, you shared your personal connection to, to, to Auschwitz or to, 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 to the Holocaust and I'm not Jewish and I've been working here in, in the museum for, for 11, 12 years. And frankly speaking, I, I believe that in fact, I, I have no personal connection to, to, to this place. And then only about two or three years ago, I found uh, a, a document. It was just a coincidence, but I found the document where uh, my name, I mean, my surname al also appears. It's very rare in, in Poland. We, we are like 50, 60 people in, 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 in Poland. And it turned out that I have a distant relative. I had a distant relative, in, in fact, who uh, as a non-Jewish Pole was taken to forced labor somewhere in Austria. Then uh, he had attempted to escape. He, he was caught, brought to Auschwitz. And finally, well, the last trace of, of this, this man is from, our, from the main camp in Auschwitz from September 19, 1943. And then he simply disappeared. I mean, we have no single trace about that man after September 4, 43. So most probably he was also at some point selected as a person who is unable to work, to be a prisoner, to, to be uh, efficient and um, it was a frankly speaking it was a very very important mo moment for, for me because it added a lot to uh, my commitment to 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 to, to the place um so that's that's just um let's say the pers personal uh, connection now um as for the ed education we have uh, the educational on like two levels there is a the basic level, the basic level, which are the tours that are given by our guides, our docents. So um, before the pandemic, we had about 2.3 million visitors in Auschwitz every year. And around 70, 75% of them took the tours, or I mean, of course, guided tours through, through Auschwitz and, and Birkenau. And this is around 1.7, 1.8 million people from all, all over the world. And they are, which is, I think, very important. They are both Jewish and, and non-Jewish. And there are people who have no personal connection to Auschwitz, no personal connection to, to the Holocaust, who sometimes, believe me, I, it's maybe very difficult to, 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 to understand it, but some people hear this story, the story of the Holocaust for, for the first time in, in their lives. And as Armen also also said at the very, very beginning, uh, this experience of, of being here, of being in, in the authentic space of, of Auschwitz is sometimes really, really a life life changing experience. And this is the education on, let's say, the basic level, but we have also what we call the in-depth education on, on Auschwitz. So we have uh, programs and uh, for different groups, for students, for soldiers, for, for, for teachers, because we also believe that except for that basic education that everyone can, can get, we should also uh, educate, educate, educate educators, those who would be able to reach to get with with the message of, of the museum to also to, to to other people and maybe later bring them to to to, to the museum of course the pandemic changed a, a lot i mean the numbers decreased but 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 still we we do see that there is a huge really a huge interest in the story of of the holocaust and uh i also want to stress that what is very important for us here here in the museum uh, it's also a very big interest in, in Poland. I mean, also among uh, students and the teachers who really see it as a very important part of the curriculum in, 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 in schools. So um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a crucial, crucial thing to, to start with students, to start with those who can later, of course, uh, shape our, our, our world. Yeah.
museum and the uh, campus? Well, we we are working on such a virtual tool and tour. Uh, we are working with uh, two big Israeli companies, Apps Flyer and and Diskin, who are preparing that uh, that tool for us. And we hope that for the next uh, International Holocaust Remember Remembrance Day in January, we'll have it it ready. So then I will, of course, everybody would be able, everywhere in the world, in, in fact, would be able to, to experience Auschwitz somehow. Um, so I, I would love to hear some questions that um, some of you all have for panelists or guests um, on the topic. And you know, not only as it pertains to uh, the historical elements, but also the educational and how we advance the, the social, cultural, and educational landscape as a result of these studies and, and this work. While we are coming in, I'm just going privilege, point of privilege for a moment. Um, you know, Thomas spoke about the, the conversion, the, the responsibility of education. Um, I, I want to give a quick shout out to the museum staff here and to the supporters of the museum in San Antonio because um, when COVID hit, um, that didn't mean that we closed down the museum. We physically closed the doors to the museum here, but we converted in a matter of, of two to three months our entire educational program and made it virtual. So that for the last two years, our, our local students, um, the museum's catchment area is actually from San Antonio all the way down to the Rio Grande Valley. And, and so we created traveling exhibits. We created additional educational uh, trunks for teachers to be able to um, take and, and bring to their classrooms. Uh, we, we shut down our old website and produced a brand new website because the old website simply couldn't take the traffic that was necessary. Um, our Jewish um, Texas Holocaust uh, week, uh, we converted to a virtual week where we had presenters every single day that we aired virtually. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, our environments are a little bit different, but I am thankful that we were able to make that pivot um, here locally so that our students would not miss out and our, teacher, and our teachers um, would still have the resources that they need. Because, um, frankly, there's an assumption that, that you know, Jonathan mentioned that because this event is the most well-documented and, and um, event in throughout history, the fact is that, that the majority of the population is actually relatively ignorant to the facts and the information that is connected to the Holocaust. And the crimes of the Holocaust are so extreme that they're beyond the realm of our normal understanding and so it's very easy for somebody who is not educated to simply not believe the numbers and the data and the, and the information that is connected to the Holocaust. So, so you know, um, I just want to give a shout out to um, everybody connected to our San Antonio Holocaust Memorial Museum because um, if not for them, the last two years would have simply been a, a lost two years in the Holocaust education across um, the South Texas area. So, fantastic. Thank you. This is for commercial. Okay. So I'm gonna, so particularly, um, Laura's father's name, um, there's an, a fund, the Oscar Ehrenberg uh, Foundation for Holocaust Education um, exists, which was, instrumental in providing us many of those resources. So, so thank you to Lauren and obviously the, the panel here today. So yes, I have a couple questions for Tomas. Um, one of them is after uh, experiencing, experiencing a tour at Auschwitz, do you still find that some of them are deniers? And if so, how would do you and does the museum address that? If you can't address it. But. Yeah. Um. No, um, just uh, what I experienced uh, last week. I I gave gave a tour for a group of students from from the Netherlands, 
who came with with their professor and um we were touring uh, Birkenau. We were already for about six hours together there. And then the professor told to me, you know, I was here a few years ago. I was a member of the special commission who examined um, the gas chambers of Birkenau. And he said to me, you know, and we did not find the core or crucial evidence that the gas chambers in Birkenau were the gas chambers. So, you know, um, and he told me this just by, by the gas chambers in, in, in Birkenau, in front of, of, of the students. And for me, it's of course a direct denial of, you know, you, you can't just, um, it's, it's just a really the denial. And um, I just told him that, first of all, uh, I've never heard about any of such commission coming and, and exit, you know, testing the, the gas chambers or whatever in, in the re recent years. And I told him that for, for me, it's, it's, a, it's just a denial. And luckily, his students were really um, aware and well, well educated, I think, before. So they all always expressed the, the, the feeling that they also think this is the, just a direct denial. And you know, frankly speaking, I, I do not have for personally, I do not have many, many um, encounters with, with the deniers because I mostly work with Israelis and I mostly give tours in, in Hebrew. So of my experience is completely different in, in fact. Um, but, but still, they are coming to the museum. Maybe you've heard about the, the, the anti-Semitic writings that appeared on, on the barracks in Birkenau just in two or three weeks weeks ago. And, you know, we did not publish this photographs. We didn't want them to feel that they won in, in a way by, you know, by publishing, by showing uh, this. But believe me, what they wrote there was really uh, an awful uh, anti-Semitic, uh, 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 uh it's, it's even very difficult for, for me to, to express it but it's, it was really something something really awful so frankly frankly speaking we do not have uh, a way of combating the, the the denial i mean it depends on the situation now it, it it's really different when the group that is for example i'm talking right now as, as a guide if, if the group supports you in in a way if they say that agree with you as a guide that uh, what that those deniers say it's 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 not right but but again a lot depends on on the situation thank you for that one of our audience members uh, recently saw a 60 minute segment uh, about a, holog a hologram program that keeps holocaust survivor stories alive even after they pass away um and uh you know i recall steven spielberg had had archived my mother and several other people in video, and this hologram sounds like a, a, a bigger deal um, in some ways. Uh, but the question is, Laura, did your father participate in any of these kind of archival storytelling to keep this story alive? He, he did. He did the um, Steven Spielberg tape, um, and uh, he there are copies here, and then of course we have copies. He didn't love talking about it, and so he was very um picky or careful about when he would speak and he really didn't like going to schools um with young children because it was too big they, they could not understand it um but he did regularly speak um at the uh kelly air force at all the air force bases would invite him and uh and i think uh at um, fort sam houston used to have him uh come and speak so he, he did um, those, those hologram um, uh, recordings are fantastic, but they require a tremendous amount of energy on the Holocaust survivor because they require hours and hours of recording of every possible conversation, every possible question. And uh, what ended up happening is, unfortunately, the technology of these, first of all, they're incredibly expensive because of everything that goes into it. 
but but they're they're holograms that that um, bring the the Holocaust survivor um, into a conversation with uh, with whether they're children or visitors, so they can ask any question, and the artificial intelligence takes the recordings of the Holocaust survivor and composes a response. So, so the reality is that, that the technology is phenomenal today, but many of our Holocaust survivors aren't capable of, of that kind of energy requirement. So the video recording is still a, a primary way for us to, to keep their stories alive. Okay, so this is another one for Tomaj. Um, and uh, one of our uh, guests has asked, could you comment on the Polish law on the Holocaust, which in which assigning responsibility for complicity on the Holocaust is being penalized. Like, luckily, the the law is you know uh, it was just discussed, and luckily it it's uh, it's not um, reactive. But uh, uh, you know um, the way of uh, the wave of right wing movements is going through the whole whole Europe right, right now. I mean I'm referring mostly to, to, to central 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 Europe. So the law was definitely a, a, a product and uh, of of that that wave. And um you know the frankly speaking uh, the, the this law this bill claimed or said that you cannot say that Poles as a nation, right? Poles as 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 a uh, as a nation are complicit in in a Holocaust, but you can say that the the individuals were. So this 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 was the 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 main idea of of of, of this of this law. But uh, as as you maybe know, after the the, the discussions uh, with with Israel with with the also with the uh, United States, the, 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 the law is not, uh, again, uh, nobody can, can be really penalized for, 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 for that right, right now. Uh, but I, I'm not saying that in the future it won't be discussed, discussed again. We, 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 just, we just don't know. I mean, you know. Legislation hasn't solved the problems. We have uh, legislation here in the state of Texas that gets twisted and turned and misinterpreted. Just like we saw in Carrollton recently, um, you know, someone brought up, you know, in, in terms of having Holocaust education or materials in the library, that they should be able to present the other point of view. What other point of view is there? And so I think we have a lot of work to do, even when we have legislation that supports our work. It, it's really up to all of us. And, and so my next kind of question for my panelists is, what can each one of us do? To advance the, the awareness, the knowledge, the, the levels of tolerance and uh, and the rights to one another. Well, that is a big, broad brush uh, question, but I would say that San Antonio is a city that people genuinely get along and try to be understanding. We have a fairly diverse population, and yet we have a very low level of hate crimes and violence, and um, there is a genuine effort with the churches, um, meaning churches and synagogues of all stripes uh, to, to interact with each other and to get along. Um, and then there are a number of organizations, um, and I would say that if this is something that we think is important, there are a number of organizations, including this museum, that you can get involved with, either on a volunteer capacity uh, or you know, in, in some other capacity, fundraising and so on, um, to help support the work. And like I said, I'm sure the United Way has uh, programs, schools have programs. Unfortunately, there is no more uh, United Communities in San Antonio. Um, but there are other organizations, I'm sure, that will rise up and take their place. But it does, it does, um, you have to be proactive. It, it doesn't come to you if you have to take the um, 
So I, I think Laura mentions a lot of the, the things that I that I would also echo. Um, you know, it boils down to people and relationships. Um, everything in life boils down to how we interact with each other and the experiences that, that we portray. And I, and I think that that you know, if there's an opportunity for you to find something that is meaningful or passionate for you. And then to be able to convey that to others and build community and build collaborations and 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 reach out whether it's Holocaust directly or whether it's you know with any other passion that you have that promotes human interactions that are positive that builds community and um, you know this, I'm sorry but no. I just wanted to interrupt for just a second to say that I grew up in a home where there was no cause that had to do with human um, suffering, prejudice, hunger, that my dad did not pick up the ball and run with it from the Rwandan genocide to the burning of the black churches in the South. Um, our whole family was engaged and involved with that. So if you can set an example for children, grandchildren, through your own actions, that is what inspired me then as I became an adult be very involved in that community because I was really just sort of trying to live up to my dad, which was impossible. But it, 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 it was it was um just so ingrained in me that you don't watch children starving on TV to do something to help them. Um so anyway, I'm sorry. No, I no, no, please that's I forget something. Yeah. We're, we're, we're 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 all in this together. Um you know I, I was an educator for 30 years in school system. That's that's where I grew. Up. That was the journey that, that brought me to to this destination, and um, and I would always, whether it was talking to the staff and trying to motivate them to be able to to carry out their their purpose every day, or whether it was for the students to grow into to being the, the the potential they have. At the end of the day, brushing your teeth and you're looking yourself in the mirror, you need to be able to ask yourself, did I make the world a better place today? If the answer is no, then you need to say tomorrow I'm going to be better. And if the answer was yes, then go have a great night's sleep. Um, you know, that's really the difference. Um, this topic is, is important. Um, it's something that is very personal. Um, you know, Tomas, I, I have to admit, I'm the, the grandson of a Pole who refused to go back to Poland after the war. Um, absolutely. You know, we wanted to take him back to, to be able to personally learn his story. Sorry, um, but he refused. Um, and my grandmother, she came from, you know, um, she was raised in the city of Celts in Poland. <clears throat> and um, in Celts, there was more death after the war of the Jews coming back than during the war. Um, so, so, yes, these are personal stories. But we need to simply be better human beings. We need to live up to our potential. And then um, we will honor those who perish in these kinds of experiences, or whether it's um, the, the Rwandan genocides or Somalia, or you know, we do a patches program at the museum in, in November. And, and this year, um, the patches program is highlighting the genocide of um, I got emotional for a second. I'm blanking. Just yeah, how the Uyghurs. Thank you. I, I apologize. Um, so we're highlighting the story of the Uyghur genocide. So you know, come join, be advocates for for simply being good people. I'd like to um, just also reflect on you know informally, all many of us, myself included, that have been part of Holocaust education uh, transmission. Uh, is the ability to tie it into to themes and topics that everyone can relate to and have experienced, all the way from bullying to discrimination and to broader, more comprehensive and global themes. So this is where we can all make very hyper-local impacts that have global resonance. Formerly, when I was uh, JCRC chair, um, it was, we never had to think about it, with, along with, standing along with our federation, when the Black community was being disparaged or um, there were miscarriages of social justice that we, we took action right away. The Asian community, LGBTQ, Muslim communities, 
we because we we know what it's like. We have we've been the canaries in the mine, so to speak. And so we cannot stand idly by as a, as a people. And we also we know that many of our our friends across space and color are the same way. Um, and I think this is the kind of community strengthening and messages. And I know uh, years ago we had a, an event um, after the graffiti happened in the neighborhood. So I partnered with the Hispanic Chamber, Federation, Catholic Charities, uh, law enforcement and, and elected officials and the, and the community at large. And we had um, a community conversation about hate crimes. And really the message was, and, and this is something that, that Laura spoke to as well, and the message was, this is not characteristic or emblematic of San Antonio. Because someone sprayed swastikas and the N-word around the neighborhood, doesn't, that's really not who we are. And, and, and none of us tolerate that. And so, you know, these anomalistic couple chuckle I mean, individuals that are spreading hate, um, yes, they should be held accountable. But all of us, I think, can take comfort and, and some, some confidence in knowing that this is really, this is not our city. And in some ways, I think we are a bit of a model city in the right way that we work together and the, the futures that we're creating for our children and grandchildren. So, you know, I want to just kind of really acknowledge everyone here and, and so many others for being a big part of that. Um, and I do want to ask Jonathan to um, you know, do our closing remarks and anything else that we would just... Thank you, Mike. Thank you all for attending. I did just want to echo something that Laura said. Um, her father also was a mentor to me. A real role, role model to me, and uh, certainly inspired many people to get involved in, in the community. Uh, Tomas, uh, I enjoyed uh, visiting with you the other day. Um, we had a connection. Uh, one of my professors in college was Jan Karski, who was a hero of the Holocaust, one of the few heroes of the Holocaust. His story is not well known, um, but he is a hero of Poland. He's a righteous Gentile. Uh, the lessons of or the, the Holocaust and Auschwitz are unique to Jewish history, um, unique to the Jewish people, but the lessons of the Holocaust and the lessons of Auschwitz are universal. They apply to people of all backgrounds, of all colors, of all ethnicities, of all, all faiths. And that's why we study. And not only to say never again, whether it's the Uyghurs or in Bosnia Herzegovina or in Darfur, but to make our own society better and to treat the stranger more kindly. Um, over there on that wall, right by Armin, is a letter just behind you. Um, that is a letter from the State Department that uh, my grandfather's relatives who were in Germany in the 1930s were trying to get out and they had a petition to come to the United States. That's the letter that denied them entry to the United States. They ended up in Auschwitz. Um, so how we treat our neighbors, how we treat uh, people, immigrants, people with different colors. Um, as I said, when we open, um, the lessons are never more relevant than they are today. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to our hosts and to the World Affairs Council putting this together and we hope to see you again.